amazed that we are saved. That you would not only come and take on the misery of this world and wear it like a garment and let it crush you to death in your Son, but that you would send your Holy Spirit towards unbelievers who are arch enemies of yours and break our will and draw us mercifully to yourself so that we embrace you freely with joy and love is an amazing thing to us. And so with trembling joy, we come upon the anniversary of the birth of your son. And we ask that you would give us help now to unfold this word from Romans in a way that would strengthen your people's faith and that would deepen the roots of their joy in hope and that would give them endurance in tribulation and that would set them to praying constantly and that would liberate love and cause your son's name to shine through their lives. This is our heart's desire now in these next few minutes. So please have mercy upon us and come. Give us help to hear and help to speak, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are in verse 12. A description of the Christian life. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer. And of course, in the wider context of the book of Romans, we know that this is joy in Jesus, hope for Jesus, patience from Jesus, tribulation with Jesus, and constant prayer through Jesus to God the Father. And since it's all about Jesus, it's not hard to weave this text into Christmas concerns, namely the birth of Jesus and the aim of that birth, his death and his resurrection and our salvation as he reigns in heaven today. Now, before I tackle the pieces of verse 12, let's put verse 12 in the scope of the paragraph 9 to 12, where we've been for a few weeks. We're going to talk about tribulation, hope, joy, endurance, prayer. But what's the main focus of verses 9 to 12? Answer, love. Verse 9, let love be genuine. And then we saw, you remember, how abhorring evil and cleaving to the good is essential for love to be love. And then... In verse 10, we saw that Paul now intensifies love with words that have to do with emotions between family members. Love one another, be devoted to one another with brotherly affection. And he showed that a part of that is loving to give honor more than you love to get honor. We're going to pass over verse 11 and come back to it later because I felt verse 12 was a better Christmas text than verse 11. My judgment call, that's where we're going, verse 12. But in verse 11, which we'll come back to later, we see that this love has a zeal about it and a fervency about it and is, in fact, service to the Lord. But now we're at verse 12. With the dominant theme of love ringing in our ears, remembering that the Necessary pathway to love is to go back to verse 12 and say, you must be transformed in the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God, that is, what is love, which is not easy to do, is it? The reason verse 2 is, is over all these verses, you've got to have a new mind, you've got to have a transformed mind, a renewed mind, to discern the will of God, that is to discern what is the loving thing to do in every situation. That is not easy. And here's one of the main reasons it's not easy. 
what love calls for in one person's life will involve you in doing things that keep you from doing things that other people need from you. In other words, there's always more than one person to be loved. There's always more than one church to be loved. There's always more than one country and nation to be loved. And therefore, if you give yourself to what one person needs or one church needs or one nation needs in one moment, you're neglecting what all these people need from you. These are really hard decisions. And the more leadership you have, the harder they get. And therefore, verse 2 is absolutely essential. We must be transformed and renewed in our minds so that when we taste a situation with all of its competing claims upon our lives, all the neighbors, all the church members, all of our enemies, all the nations, all the movements, and all the needs for our money, we smell the will of God. We can just smell love. We smell the most loving thing to do. What else can you say? You can't do it by reason. 10,000 claims upon your life, and you think you're going to reason through all the pros and cons of every single one of those claims upon your life, and at the end of the day have worked through it all in detail and done it all with measurements and come out at the end of the day saying, now I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, with all this reasoning, this act tonight is the most loving act. It isn't going to work that way. Your life is not lived that way. All of Romans 12 is written to help change our minds, transform our minds, renew our minds. So when we get to verse 12 now, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. We say all of that for love's sake. Because love is the banner flying over these texts. Rejoice in hope for the sake of love. Be patient in tribulation for the sake of love. Be constant in prayer for the sake of love. And in this way, Christ as the ground and the goal of all these things will shine more brightly in your life, especially at Christmas time when the need is so great for the real Christ to shine forth. So here's my question. How do all these things, love, joy, hope, Endurance or patience, tribulation, constant prayer, how do they all relate to each other in your life? How do you live this out? Let's start with tribulation. If you wonder why you're starting with tribulation, it's right there in the middle. Be patient in tribulation. It's because it's unique in the list. If you think through, you know, how, are, how are all these things alike and how are they all different? Tribulation sticks out. Love, joy, hope, Patience, they're all virtues. They all rise up by grace in the heart, and they're good. They're morally good. Tribulation is not a virtue. It happens to you. It's another category altogether. It's a, it's a thing that happens to you. It's done to you, or nature, or calamity, or the will of evil people. It happens to you, whereas love and joy and Endurance and patience and hope, those are all things rising spiritually from inside of you. And so I'm going to put it in a category by itself and say, okay, what's it got to do with all these others? And my answer is, it's the environment. It's the setting of all these other things. It is the normal environment of Christian life. Some tribulations we share with unbelievers, like sickness, calamity, and death. Some tribulations are unique to Christians, like being persecuted for Jesus' sake. My main point here is it's normal. Tribulation is normal Christian life. It's the setting for love. It's the setting for joy. It's the setting for hope. It's the setting for patience, and it's the setting for prayer. Affliction is where we live, and if you don't, you will. And therefore, it will be helpful for you tonight to listen carefully 
and learn it's normal so that when it comes, you will, as Peter says, not think it's strange when the fiery ordeal overtakes you. So if you have a season right now in your life when all is smooth, thank God, receive it, use it, be energized by it, give yourself to those who don't, your day will come. It will come. And so if you don't need this tonight, put it on. You will need it before your life is over. Jesus was the best man who ever lived on planet Earth and experienced the most tribulation. None of us has any right to experience any less affliction than Jesus. If you are experiencing less affliction than Jesus, who was a perfect man, and you're not, if you're experiencing less affliction than Jesus, it is sheer mercy. For Jesus, it was affliction from the beginning. His birth was a scandal. Conceived out of wedlock, for goodness sakes. What a way to begin the life of the Son of God. And we know, of course, it was a virgin birth, born and conceived of the Holy Spirit. But to everybody else around, it was absolutely scandalous. And he wore it till the day he died. Remember the interaction with the Pharisees at that one point. We have Abraham as our father. We were not born the way you were born. He wore that badge of illegitimacy till the day he died. It was a scandal from the beginning. He was born in an animal feeding trough. He was threatened and hated by the political rulers from the beginning, and they almost got him, and he became a refugee in Egypt for two years to escape the hostilities of the regime. And all his life long, it was affliction until finally he was accused of sedition against Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. And he died a criminal, like a piece of meat hanging on a cross, the very perfect Son of God. We do not deserve any less affliction because He was perfect. That's how Christianity began. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus said that, Luke 14, 27. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? Matthew 25, 10, 25. Paul taught all the churches. It was Christianity 101 in the book of Acts when he said to the churches he had just planted in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Normal Christian life is trouble, trouble, trouble. Peter said it like this, 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Couldn't be plainer. It is not strange when you walk through fire. It is normal Christian living. Not to have it is abnormal. Romans 8, 23. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, you can hear what's going on there. It hurts. 
an eye problem, a back problem, an arthritic problem, a hearing problem, and a, a seeing problem, cancer. It hurts. We groan. We who have the Holy Spirit groan inwardly, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Tribulation in this fallen world till Jesus comes is normal. Be ready. That's why he said, be patient in tribulation. It's normal. Be patient. So let's be biblically balanced at Christmas time at Bethlehem. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all the people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. And he grows up and says, Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter-in-law against her mother, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. That's what he grew up to say to Christians. So let's be balanced. This text, Romans 12, 12, says rejoice, and it says endure. It's another word for be patient, endure, tribulation. They're right there back to back. They're right there back to back. Rejoice, endure, rejoice, endure. Right there, no doubt about it. This is normal Christian living. The joy of a Christian is an embattled joy. It is a joy to be fought for. It is a joy always under attack, always threatened by tribulation. So it doesn't say that we don't get tribulation when we become Christians. It says rejoice in them. Indeed, he goes on and he says rejoice because of them. Now we go back to chapter 5. So turn there with me. I had Wes read that passage because I wanted to build on it at this point. We're, sh we're moving now from the tribulation orientation of the beginning, the environment, the setting, to things like joy and hope and endurance, all of which come together in this text as well as Romans 12, 12. Romans 5, 1, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained peace access by faith into the grace in which we stand. Now recognize this phrase. And we rejoice in hope. There it is. Almost the same phrase as 1212. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. Not just enduring them. That's amazing. How can that be? And he gives the answer, knowing that suffering, affliction, produces endurance. There's that word again. And endurance produces character or approvedness. And character or approvedness produces hope. There's that word. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. So here's really plain, isn't it? Christian joy and hope and patient endurance are not freedom from tribulation. They are not based on freedom from tribulation. They're not even merely in spite of tribulation. That's the amazing thing about chapter 5. They are because of tribulation, because tribulation works something. It does something to us that's good for us, according to chapter 5, verse 3. It produces endurance and approvedness, which produces hope, and it doesn't ever let us be put to shame. So, Paul doesn't just tolerate tribulation. He takes tribulation by the throat, this enemy, which is threatening to be our master. 
which it is in your life from time to time, threatening to be your master, the tribulation, the trouble, relational or physical. He takes it by the throat and he says, you will not master me, you will serve me. And that's what verse 3 says. Tribulation works patience. Patience works provenness, and provenness works hope. So tribulation has become my servant to make me patient and hopeful and full of strength in the face of everything that comes my way. In other words, what tribulation does is push the roots of joy down into hope because there's nothing in the present to be real excited about. It pushes the root of joy down into hope. The very act of trying to destroy our joy, Satan is made to drive the root deeper into God. Isn't God great? He doesn't just defeat his enemies. He makes his enemies serve his holy purposes. Let's look at the root of joy. It says in verse 12 of chapter 12 and verse 2 of chapter 5, Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. In other words, it seems to be that hope is the soil in which this flower of joy is growing. You've got to plant your joy in hope. It grows, it gets its strength, it gets its juice, it gets its energy, it gets its life from hope. Now, let's read all of verse 2 and see what that is. Through him, Christ we also have obtained access by faith in, into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So joy is rooted in hope in the glory of God. What does that mean? Start here. It means that for Christians, grounds for hope will often not be in the present. Reasons for hope will often not be in the present. It must be rooted in hope. Hope is out there. It's coming. It's coming. But right now, you look around, this is bad. This is really, really, really bad. And, and the reasons for hope are just not present. That's why this, this tribulation, either it's going to destroy us, it's going to make us shake our fist in God's face and say, well, if this is the way you treat your children, I'm out of here. Or it can drive our roots down into hope because of the promises of God. So what is the ground basis and the goal of Christian hope here? You know what that, that, those two words click with you, ground and goal, ground and goal? Let me, use, let me use an analogy just to make sure you know where I'm going. If you were on the Union side in the Civil War, you might have said, Ulysses S. Grant is our hope for victory. Now, that's not a complex sentence. Let me just identify the ground and the goal. Ulysses S. Grant is our hope for victory. What you mean is Grant is the ground, the basis. He's got the savvy. He's got to pull this off or it's not going to happen. And the goal is victory. So ground and goal. That's what I'm asking. What's the ground and the goal of hope in the Bible, in our tribulation? Verse 2 is real helpful. Verse 1 is helpful in chapter 5. So I'm still here. Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The ground of our hope is that God, on the basis of Jesus Christ, declares me just. That's what justify means, declares me just. I put my faith in one who is just and one who does die for my sins, and I don't put my faith in me anymore or anything around me. I renounce all reliance upon me. I put my faith in Jesus, and God, because of Jesus, counts me like Jesus. His righteousness, we can picture it as a robe, 
is mine now. I'm in him, and what he is, he is for me, and he's righteous, and he's acceptable, and therefore in him I'm righteous, and I'm acceptable by faith alone. And that's our ground of hope. When I face God as a judge someday, I will not plead my righteousness. I'll plead his righteousness and my faith in him alone. So I'll ask you tonight, right now, what are you going to plead when you face your maker and judge in maybe 20 years? 30, 40, 50, 10, 5, two, 3 hours? What will your plea be when he says, so what right do you have as a sinner in my absolutely perfect presence in heaven? What, what will your answer be? If you try to say, I was as good as Joe, that will not cut it. You might have been as good as Joe. That's not a help. I got baptized. That will not help. I was a member at Bethlehem Baptist Church. That's a good one. Wrong. Wrong. Not a good, not a good one. Christ is good. Christ is good. We're sinners. That's the wrong plea. So I just hope some of you are not Christians in this room, and I want to make it really plain. You do not become a Christian by going to church, getting baptized, keeping the rules. You become a Christian by despairing of your own righteousness, your own worthiness, and throwing yourself like a helpless person on Christ for his righteousness and his forgiveness, his mercy. So the answer when God says, what right do you have in my holy presence? Your answer is going to be, I hope, from the bottom of your heart, I have no right to be in your presence. But your gospel said, if I would believe in the one who has a right to be in your presence, your son who died in my place and bore all my sins, that his righteousness would count for me, and therefore I plead Christ. May I please come in and enjoy you for Christ's sake forever. Big smile's going to get on God's face. He's going to say, that's a very good answer and a very Christ-exalting answer and a very God-honoring answer and a very self-humbling answer. And you certainly, indeed, for his sake, may come in where he gets all the glory here I just want to be really plain that the ground of our hope, we're talking hope here, rejoice in hope, rejoice in hope. You can have hope, that hope, by being saved like that. And the goal, you're plain at the end of verse 2, isn't it? I'm still in chapter 5. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Give yourself a little test now. He might ask, as you stand before him at the judgment, not what right do you have to come in here. He might ask, I suspect he will ask, why do you want to come in here? And if you say, I don't like being sick. My mother's in there. Hell is hot. Those are three bad answers. They're not wrong answers. They're not wrong. They just, they don't honor Christ. They honor health. They honor mom. And they honor your fear of pain. You want to honor Christ with this answer. What's the answer? I want to see the glory of God in the face of Christ forever with ever increasing joy. That's why I want in there. I want to see and savor the most spectacular beauty in the universe forever and ever with ever increasing measures of appreciation. That's what I want in there for. And God's going to get another smile on his face and say, Woo! Amen! Amen! Jesus be praised! That's what I feel about my son. You want to see my glory in my son's face? Come on in. That's why people come in here. Yes, you see your mom. Yes, you'll never be sick again. Yes, you get out of hell. But you better want to be with me. Or it's all about you. And that's not what heaven is. So we've got the ground of our hope in Christ's righteousness and death and our simple faith. 
by which we're clothed with righteousness, and we've got the goal of our hope to see His glory, and this is the hope that will wipe away every tear and rectify every wrong and make us feel that it was all worth it. All the tribulation was worth it. Let me read you one verse from Paul about that. 2 Corinthians 4.17. I love this verse because your day will come. This slight momentary affliction, by which he meant a lifetime of trouble, this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That means what you will experience when you taste the glory of God on the other side of death or when He comes will outweigh all pain in this life, no matter how much. It will outweigh all misery in every relationship as you have walked with Christ through it. It will outweigh every tribulation, and you will look back and say, it was a light and momentary affliction by comparison. Here and now, it feels very heavy and very long. It isn't. It isn't. Rejoice in hope. Talk about joy for a minute. It's rooted in hope. Now we've seen the goal and the ground of hope. Now he says joy is in there. Joy is in hope. Rejoice in hope. What if somebody said, that seems too limited. It seems like you're saying that all joy isn't, all the reasons for joy are in the future. I mean, is it okay to rejoice in candles, kids, music, food, family? I mean, does it all have to be rooted What's coming? Can it, is there anything now that's legitimate to be happy about? That's a really good question. I got two answers for that, a shepherd answer and a wise man answer. Shepherds, they didn't have anything. They're poor, out cold. Wise men, they had gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There's a way for the poor to rejoice in hope, and there's a way for the rich to rejoice in hope. Let's do the shepherd thing first. Tribulation is normal. Pain is normal. Stress is normal. Trouble is normal. And so Paul says, don't lose heart. Rejoice in hope. The best is always yet to come for the Christian. Always, 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 for eternity, the best is yet to come. You need that, especially on the hour of your death. And therefore, rejoice in hope when the days are dark. If you're a shepherd-like person and you have nothing to bring, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Rejoice in hope. There's a glory coming that will make it all worth it. That's the first thing I think Paul would answer. And, and now he'll answer for the wise man question like this. Okay, there are, there are people, in fact, every one of us in this room who have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're a pretty well-to-do country. We're very, very rich. So we're in that category. What if pleasures abound for a season in your life before the, the troubles come? They all point to their creator and their goal, namely Christ himself. One day, Christ is going to be experienced as the all-in-all -all pleasure of our lives, and every other subordinate pleasure will be pointing toward him, like rays coming from the sun of joy will be running up those rays into Christ. We do taste the sweetness of Christ's fellowship now, but it's going to be infinitely better later. Every good thing that comes into your life, and there are many, should be received with thanksgiving, the Bible says, and you should enjoy those good things if they are not idols. 
and they are idols if they do not provide an occasion for enjoying Christ. If sex, food, family, music do not provide in their delights a springboard into worship whereby you delight in the giver, they're idols. Everything is for Christ. And so, no, I don't deny that there are things in the present that we should enjoy. I don't think rejoice in hope means that you shouldn't rejoice in the present, in things in the present. I think it means if they are rooted in the future where Christ is going to be all in all, then let your heart land on them with joy and bounce Christward. Then they're not idols, they're occasions for worship. Finally, let's link the last elements, patient endurance, love, and prayer to rejoicing in hope. It says, be patient or endure in tribulation. Now I'm in chapter 12 and I'm going to stay there. Be patient and endure in hope. I say I'm going to stay there. I'm going to quote Hebrews now. Though not going back to Romans 5, I don't think. Hebrews 12, 2 is for me one of the most magnificent statements on how love and hope and joy relate that are in the Bible. So I'll read it to you. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, there's joy, that was set before him, there's hope, endured the cross, there's love. It could not be plainer. Hope enables joy in the midst of tribulation, which produces the endurance, which is love. The most loving act that was ever performed on planet Earth is the death of Jesus on the cross for ungodly people like us. That's the most loving thing that ever happened. By what strength did it happen? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's a statement of your power in the Christian life, not just his. Whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross and live it the way I lived it. Set your hope on the things that are coming. Let your joy flow back from the future into the present in the midst of tribulation. And in that joy, take strength in endurance and embrace the cross whatever it is that costs for love's sake in your life. So let me sum up where we've been. Tribulation, trouble, calamity, conflict, cancer, death, these are normal Christian life. But Christ has come. Here we are. It's Christmas time. Christ has broken in to the tribulation. He's broken in to the cancer. He's broken in to the marital conflict and problem. He's broken into Iraq. He's broken into American social security upheaval. He's broken into public education stresses. He's broken into my emotional conflicts. Christ, by his incarnation, has taken on flesh like ours and been tempted in every way like we are. And he died to kill it all. He put his foot on the neck of Satan and death and hell and sin. And once it was killed, he rose triumphant from the dead and became my righteousness, and my hope. Now, he has made himself the glory of paradise so that he's the center of everything and I get the highest pleasures in heaven by seeing him. So, I rejoice in this unutterable and exalted glory. As 1 Peter 1, 8 says, Here we do not see him, but we 
believe in him. And now we do not see him, but we rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy as we receive the salvation of our soul. So we don't see him now, but one day we'll see him. And our joy is flowing back to us out of the future hope of seeing Jesus. And with this joy, we endure with Jesus all the sacrifices of love. One closing warning. This is a don't take this sermon to mean that paragraph. Do not infer from the fact that since tribulation is normal and joy should be in hope flowing from the future, that you should therefore disappear out of ordinary public life and just cultivate you and God being happy in your trouble while the world goes to hell because it's all about the future anyway, not the present. We're not going to go there as a church. That is not what the Bible teaches. Rather, it goes like this. Since your future is absolutely secure, and since your future is absolutely glorious, you are freed not to grasp and crave and scratch after power and money and pleasure on earth. You are liberated to love like nobody else loves. You're liberated to be engaged in politics liberated to be engaged at work, liberated to be engaged in the neighborhood, caring about what this world looks like, feels like, is experienced like, because whatever happens to you, you're home free. I mean, the future being wrapped up, a hope being set out there that absolutely makes your future certain, makes you an absolutely free person who doesn't need to mount up stuff as though this were heaven. Got to have a heavenly house. Got to have a heavenly neighborhood. Got to have a heavenly car, heavenly cabin, heavenly kids. You don't. Heaven will come soon enough. We're here to serve. Unless you become the slave of all men, you can't even be my disciple. The liberty that comes with Christmas hope is not a liberty of escape. It's a liberty of engagement. So give yourself away to this world. And if it costs you, I promise you, in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be worth it. Every cost will be worth it. Let a Christmas people hit this nation in all lowliness, in all humility, serving, loving, sacrificing, dying, and the nations. Last comment. So, Piper, why didn't you talk about prayer? It's in the text. Two answers. Number one, I'm out of time. <laughs> Number two, this is a plan. Next Sunday begins prayer week. May it be one of the most powerful weeks of the year. This is sweet to do Advent together. It is sweeter to get on our faces during a week of prayer from the 26th on into the new year. And so I will pick it up right there next Sunday. But I'll tell you the answer of how prayer fits into what I've said tonight. Give him one sentence. By prayer, we see and we savor the hope of glory. If you're not seeing it, if you're not savoring it, if it's not satisfying your soul, you need a prayer week, big time. And we will do it together. But the main point is, Christ has broken into the world, taken our tribulation, upon him, created the possibility of joy in hope, and that joy right now, tonight, as you leave into your tribulation, 
will give you endurance to bear your cross so that Christ is made to shine in your Christmas life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that joy to the world would not just be a song. The Lord has come. Let earth, let earth receive her king would not be merely a song, but an earnest, heartfelt prayer. Pray without ceasing. Be constant in prayer. Pray this song all year long. World, 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 receive your joy, your King. And so enable us as a church to spread a passion for your supremacy in all things, for the joy of all peoples, for the joy of